Today I have the privilege to visit in, uh, with Kent Vosper. He was a prisoner of war, first of all. And in World War II, he flew B-24 aircraft as a pilot. He was shot down and was a prisoner of war in Germany and I believe other countries of Europe and uh, finally, of course, come back to the United States. His uh, home is at uh, Nietzsche, North Dakota. That's up in the northeast corner of North Dakota. And uh, today we're going to hear his, his story about how he started out in life and where he went to school and how he got in the Air Force and, and how he won the war, then you see, eventually. So just go ahead, Kent. Thank you, Elmer, especially the part about winning the war. <laughs> Uh, I was born in Nitchie, North Dakota, November 10th, 1921, and uh, went to school there. And, uh, well, I went to country school for a couple of years, and then I went to, then I graduated to town school, and uh, went to school there and graduated from high school. And went down to, um, then I went to the AC. Uh, the old cow college, you guys here in Grand Forks like to call it, but anyhow, I went to school down there. Then I, I couldn't get in. Uh, I, I, I was with a kid by the name of Kenneth McClarty, and he was in the aviation part of it. <clears throat> he flew out to Hector Field a, a lot, and I spent a lot of time out there with him. And I wanted to get into that program. So then the next year, the program was full in Fargo, so I went down to Wapenden and I was taking mechanical engineering and uh, so I got in down there and that's where I learned to fly was was uh, down there and uh, Piper Clubs in or? It was a it was a it was a Cub Coupe oh, yeah. I don't know if you remember that or not I don't think too many of them are ever no. built but they had a, and Art Swanson I think was the director of aviation down there at that time <coughs> he commanded a lot of respect in North Dakota. And then, uh, of course, uh, this was down there, I, I think um, my friend and I, Garnet Symington, went to a movie, Sergeant York, and the movie stopped in the middle and they said, Pearl Harbor has been bombed. Well, it was just about unbelievable. But anyhow, from there on, uh, we were going to join the Marines. There was a Blair boy and myself and Garnett, and we were going to join the Marines. And one morning at 7 o'clock, which was early for for us to be up, or there was a knock at the door, and there was my dad, Fred Vosper, and Garnett's dad, Earl Symington. And uh, they said, we want to talk to you boys. And uh, they sat down there, and uh, and we were talking about the war. And they, we said, we thought we should join the Marines. And uh, they said, well, we don't think you should join the Marines. <laughs> we think you should wait for a while, and uh, you'll, you'll get in there soon enough. And so on their uh, more or less command, we stayed out of the Marines, which, thank goodness, didn't happen, because all of those early Marines, so many of them died in the South Pacific. And uh, I kind of, I th kind of think they, they saved us for later on. And so Garnett and I were to join the Air Force later on, and uh, we went down to uh, San Antonio, Randolph Field. We got this notice, Randolph Field. We thought this was this was the biggie. We thought this was really something, and uh, we went down to Randolph and took the train down. It was only what is it wasn't the only, but there was. Mostly you travel by train or by bus, and uh, and we found out that it wasn't all all that much fun because uh, we got in there about four o'clock in the morning, and we had to go and get our sheets and our blankets for our army cots, and then at six o'clock they got us up, and you know we'd only had about two hours sleep, so we we realized that this wasn't wasn't going to be a picnic. And uh, 
Well, there was, uh, we waited there. We were waiting, waiting to get into a primary school. And uh, I remember one incident uh, when I was there, Garnet and I were in formation and, and uh, they asked for truck drivers. And of course, Garnet and I both being from the farm, we thought, hey, this is our opportunity to get out there and drive a truck. Well, we ended up pushing the truck in the mess hall about 4 o'clock in the morning, 4.30, putting the china out and, and, uh, and then afterwards cleaning all that up. So right away we learned quick, don't volunteer too quick when you're, when you're in the service. And anyhow, we went on, finally we went on to Curtis Field at uh, Brady, Texas. Was that primary or basic? Yeah. I mean, uh, that was a primary, primary school and yeah. we flew PT-19s, which was a Fairchild aircraft. Uh, single wing, wasn't it? Single, wing, yeah. low wing, open cockpit. Yeah. And, uh, Is that a pretty good airplane? It was uh, It was a good, I believe it was as good a trainer as they built in those days. Yeah. Of course, they built the Stearman, too, which... That's the one I had, that Yeah, I think, plane, you know. I think everybody kind of wanted the Stearman, but yeah. you took what you, you well, got. Sure. And, uh, and then we went on to uh, Basic, which was at Greenville, Texas. I guess maybe I could slip back to Brady for a while. My mother and my wife, not at that time, she was my girlfriend, came down to visit us. And uh, my wife and I got married there. And we always told the story, which wasn't quite true, that we didn't have enough money to send them both back on the bus, so we sent my mother. <laughs> the wedding license was cheaper than uh, than uh, bus, bus fare back all, all the way back to North Dakota. And uh, from there we went to basic, which I flew BT-13s there, that was... I think all the basic train trainers had BT-13s, didn't they? Yeah, I think probably that they did. That was a pretty good plane, too. It was pretty good, but the, a lot of times, you know, if you were, if they were teaching you spins, tail spins, a lot of times they wouldn't come out. You'd have to pop them two or three times before, the, yeah. before you could kick them out of the spin. And so there was some some problems with that. They, well, there were accidents, yeah. A lot uh, of, they uh, started having accidents, of course, in yeah. basic, after in, uh, yeah. in basic there. Yeah, it was, and so they'd ground them for a few days. <laughs> Pretty soon you'd be back in them and yeah. building your hours up. Then the next school I went to was at uh, Altus, Oklahoma. And that was a twin engine. We made our choice. We made our choice there in uh, whether we were going to fly bombers or fighters. And of course, everybody wanted fighters. Yeah, sure. But uh, there had to be a few bomber pilots too, so quite a few. And so we ended up taking twin engine training in a UC 78 or AT 1819. AT 10 was, I think. AT Anyhow, it was a twin engine. Yeah. They call it the bamboo bomber. It was built yeah. by Cessna. And from there on, we went to, uh, well, we graduated from there. We got our wings, yeah. and and my wife pinned my wings on. And where, where was that field now again, you say? That was Altus, at Altus, Oklahoma. Where, oh, Altus. Where's that located from? Well, that's right in, uh, it's right in the Panhandle. Oh, up there. I see. Yeah, yeah. it's in the western West, part. Western part, yeah. Oh. And there was, you know, there was a lot of farm country. Now yeah. there's a lot of oil wells through yeah. that area. And uh, where should we go next? Well, what did, did you go to? A, were you a replacement, or how did? What after you've got your wings? Then well, did you join a group, or did they? Uh... <coughs> after, after you got your wings, you went to B twenty four, B twenty five, one of the twin engine schools and I went to Liberal Kansas B twenty fours. And uh not as a whole not as a whole group though, but no, just as, as a as a yeah. transition. As a transition. You, you had you had to have some hours between yeah. a sure. UC seventy eight and a B twenty four. It was a big jump there. Well it was a big jump. It was yeah. four engines and yeah. hundred and ten foot wingspan yeah. and so that was that was a big jump. And then uh then I think it was Topeka, Kansas we went to, and I got my crew there. And that was the co-pilot and the bomb and the they, bombardier. They got the whole crew together at Topeka? Yeah. 
Then where did you go for your training? Well, then we went to El Paso, Texas. And uh, that first flight, you had a lot of people, all your crew was sitting there <laughs> wondering whether you are going to get the thing off or get it down again or what was going to happen. But you had your hands full because your co-pilot never had any tra uh, training in B-24s either. No. So, so I, I had ended up quite fortunate, I think. I got it up and I got it down yeah. and uh, my crew was quite happy and uh, certainly made me happy. <coughs> well, did you, did that, did your crew now join a group in the States or did you go over as a replacement well, in England? Well, we were... No, no, you went to North Africa, did you? No, yeah. no. What then, we ended up, we thought we were going overseas, but then we ended up in a radar training center on the East Coast, Langley Field. Oh, yeah. And one night we'd fly to uh, Maine and the next night we'd fly to Florida. And of Looking course, for submarines. Well, it was it really was it was really instruction. Oh, I you see. You know, they'd identify cities on the way up. Oh, and, I see. And uh, no, we weren't quite ready for that yet. And so, uh, and so then when we, then finally we were assigned an aircraft, which we were supposed to fly the Atlantic with. And uh, then about a week after that, they they pulled us out of that and put us on Liberties. Of course, Liberty ship. Yeah, Liberty ship. But of course, we all wanted to fly the Atlantic Ocean. That was sure. be kind of a feather in our cap. But we ne right. we never got to do that. And so uh, then I was assigned to uh, the 15th Air Force, which is in Italy, and the 454th Bomb Group, 739th Squadron. Well, did that convoy take you to Italy then, or where did you yeah. go? To? Or it England? Took or? It took us uh, down by North Africa. I think there was. Uh, Oh, I can't recall, but there was well over a hundred ships in that. I know they had in that big convoy, convoy, and we only made about ten, eleven knots an hour. Yeah. So it took a long time. It took twenty-nine days to get to Italy. That's a long time yeah. when you're when you're bunked up together as close yeah. as we were. And so then uh, we went on a few training missions over there, and, and then proceeded into. The regular schedule. Where was your home base then? In Italy? Yeah, it was in Italy, down by the Spur. Oh, I The see. name of the city was Sharonola. Yeah. And uh, that was... The, the whole group was... Uh, did you have a group there then? Yeah, that was our group. Of 24s, yeah. Yeah. What about... Do you have any fighters located there at that base? Well, not at that base, no. Or 25s? But, or? but we did have... We did have an escort. Yeah. P-51s. Yeah. And flown by blacks, by de Negroes. And, and they were really good, and we were really happy to have them go along with yes. us. A couple of those blacks were shot down. They were in Stalag Lift 1 with me. Were they? Yep. Uh -huh. I know it said something, I read something where it said didn't think they were in combat too much, no. but they were right with the rest oh, of yeah. them. Oh, yeah, they were, and they were good pilots, yeah. too. They were, they were aggressive. They were, yeah. yeah, I know they were. They were hot shots, and yeah. they were good. What are some of the missions you flew to what places? Well, we covered... Uh, about as far as north as we got was uh, was Blackhammer, Germany. A lot of people, and when we were interrogated, they thought we'd hit Berlin. But as far as I know, the 15th Air Force never bombed Berlin. No. But they were they were interested because they wanted to know about the carburation and how we were getting that kind of mileage out of it. Yeah. We could fly to Berlin, but we couldn't carry much of a bomb no. load because. Instead of bombs, it'd be all gasoline. What you, what kind of bomb load did you carry normally? Well, we carried, as I recall, you know, it was the distance to the target yeah, regulated sure. that quite a bit. Yeah. But uh, we carried about, uh, I'd say, eight five hundred pounders. Yeah, that'd be normal. Uh, yeah. I think it was about yeah. right. Yeah. How fast do you fly, or how high do you fly? Well, we flew just as damn high as we could get. Yeah. <laughs> that would be. 30 to 32,000. I don't think we ever bombed under 30,000. No. Which is extreme altitude for a B-24. Well, you had to get pretty high to get over the... You had through over those Alps, did you? You were mountains yeah, there? Yeah, we were... Uh, we climbed from the, from our base all the way to the oh, target. Yeah. And we got up there just as high as we could get, but... Uh, Th now, you bombed in the daytime normally, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was all... What were some of your targets that you bombed? Well... The day uh, we went down was Linz, Austria. That was the 
Hermann Goring Steelworks at uh, Linz, Austria. And uh, that particular day, we, uh, we didn't drop the first time. Why, I don't know, because I never came back to find out, never got back to find out. But uh, then we went on to Salzburg, and uh, we didn't drop there, and then we came back. And by that time, our escort was all gone. And I think, uh, I think what the Germans used to fly, they used to fly a fighter at our altitude, and then they'd radio that to the anti-aircraft gunners, because that's, that's what shot us down, was anti-aircraft, it wasn't fighters. Where'd they hit you? Well, they hit us, you know, and then again, I never did see the outside of the aircraft, no. because we bailed out of it. But we lost two engines. One engine out entirely, and then one intermittently, we'd get some power out of it. But our biggest threat was we couldn't feather, couldn't feather that engine that was out. Well, that, that was a problem, yeah. That was many, a big problem. Many of them, yeah. And so, right off the bat, and then the windshield was knocked out, and the top turret was knocked out, and uh, the wind, you know, 200 mile an hour wind, 60 below, at 30,000 feet were coming in, and so that we lost probably maybe eight, 10,000 feet on that first first blast. So uh, before we got everything under control, my uh, engineer found a piece of plywood. I don't know where he found it, but he got that in in the windscreen, replacing the windscreen and, and cutting down that wind coming into the cockpit. And so that helped a lot. So then, in the, then it was decision time. Uh, did we go to Switzerland or did we, or did we try to make it home? And of course, it was kind of a black mark if you didn't try for home. So we were trying. We try. We thought we'd get at least. There was an island in the Adriatic, and the name of that island is Viz, V I Z, or V I S, depends which spelling, which English or Yugoslav spelling, and. Uh, so we thought we'd try to get there. There was a crash strip there where you could slide them in. And when we got about, oh, three, 400 miles from there, 300 probably, we were running out of fuel. And it had been a practice, and it was approved by the Air Force, that you would, we had 1,000 gallons we carried in our, internally in our outboard tanks, but you had to get that to your main cells. And so we'd take a half on the way up, we'd transfer it, and a half on the way back. Well, we couldn't, on the way back, we couldn't get that 500 gallons. So we ran out of gas and probably still had 500 gallons on board. I mean, the, the pump system didn't work. Uh, no. Yeah. The, the lines were severed or yeah. something was yeah. wrong. And of course, we never got to examine it to no. really find out what was wrong. So we had to, we, uh, we were flying over and over, we were still over the top of an overcast. And when we saw an opening in the clouds and it showed the, the coast of, it, of uh, Yugoslavia, then we went on about five minutes or so, and we still had we were still had enough gas for that, and then we bailed out over the top of the for overcast, and that was was that along the coast over the water or over land? That was over land. We yeah. wanted to be sure yeah. we were over land because yeah. uh, quite a number of us on that crew could not swim and anyhow would make you wouldn't happen. last any time no. in that cold water this no. was january yeah did uh did they all bail out then yeah we all bailed out <coughs> at what height altitude about you know i i don't i can't remember that but we were probably at 13 14000 yeah. uh, hills there mountains there probably come up to about 6 yeah and uh, uh so you're you know, you're, they ask you to try to all go out at the same time so you hit the ground at the sure. same time. So you're together. Well, there's three places on a B-24 to bail out. And uh, there's one that's here, the nose wheel is here, and there's a, uh, you can just open up the doors. And uh, then there's a bailout back here, and then, of course, the bomb bay. Yeah. And so we're all lined up ready for bail out and I gave the order to bail out and then I, I ran back to the Bombay because I'm over here on this side, yeah. co-pilot's on the other side. I run back, the, the front part of the aircraft is split and, the, and when I come back to go down into the Bombay here, the, 
navigator, not the navigator, the bombardier and the nose gunner were coming out from underneath. And the nose gun the, is, had been frozen shut. They had, I, they had been frozen shut and they had urinated on the door and it was frozen shut and so they couldn't get out. So then I had to go back and straighten up the airplane. And so then when I came back, the navigator was standing on the catwalk and I thought he was scared to go out and so I pushed him out and went out right behind him. Well, uh, Did they have chest packs or uh, backpacks? Well, the pilots, we used backpacks. It was your choice. Yeah, yeah. But we wore a backpack because all the rest of the guys just wore the harness and they could snap a parachute on. They'd always keep that parachute real close and they could grab that parachute and yeah. snap it on and then if they had trouble opening it, they could pull it out. But the backpack was not that convenient. So, so anyhow, I fell free for quite a while and fell through the overcast and then the ground was above me and the sky was below me and I kept, uh, all we ever did for bailout practice was to read the chapter on it. Yeah, sure. And you read it a couple times and you, do, you, know, you didn't plan on bailing out no. anyhow, especially over Fortress Europe. Yeah. You didn't want to bail out. So, <clears throat> so uh, I uh, finally I pulled my ripcord and, and that snapped me around and, and uh, I was in a proper position then. But anyhow, here, and of course this parachute is over the top of me, like an umbrella. Yeah. And I can't see up or anything, and I can't, you know, what happened to the aircraft? I don't know what, it just kept going, it went further east, and it's over there someplace. But anyhow, here comes this, this GI, and a, and my, the guy had pushed out, the navigator had pushed out, here he came. And he was traveling quite a bit faster than I was going down. Oh, he, oh I had to shoot. And uh, the reason was when he bailed out, he was probably, I probably had the plane trimmed up, so maybe we were doing about 250. So the plane was doing about 250. Well, he pulled the cord, rip cord right away. He didn't have our time to think it over, I guess. And he ripped out about three or four panels. Yeah. And as he went by, I could see the silk spinning waving. in the, waving in the wind at me and, and uh, when I got down on the ground he was pretty angry. And I said, uh, what were you, were you scared to go out? No, he said, I was saying my prayers. Well, I said, you could have said them on the way down like I did. And uh, anyhow, by that time, here was three or four Yugoslavs, no, five or six, coming up the side of the mountain and they were popping away at us already and so that, that ended that discussion, right? <laughs> Quite. Say, did you have flak jackets on those missions? Oh, yeah. yeah. Did you oh, wear, yeah. yeah. Oh. You wore a helmet, too, didn't you? Steel well, helmet? Well, the pilots, we didn't wear. No. No, we had this, we had a armor around us. Oh, yeah, I remember they had that. And it was yeah. about, oh, it must have been at least three eight yeah. inches thick. Yeah. But everybody else wore flight jackets yeah. and flak helmets. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't have that armor in that, the ships that I flew. Yeah. But we have, we wore the, Flak jackets. The pilots wore the flak jackets in the ships that I. Yeah, you know. would, if you didn't have the armor. Yeah. Because, you know, if you didn't have a pilot, you were in big trouble. If you were the pilot was knocked out, well then. That's right. Yeah, then See where I, uh, Stog Drift One, there where I was at, it happened. They were br bombing Berlin. This is another yeah. story. I shouldn't maybe tell it, but. Oh no, it's fine. But the, uh, the pilot was hit in the head. Wow. And he turned kind of crazy. Mm. So the co-pilot had to hit him over the head with a wrench to knock him out. Of course, after he was knocked out, he was in pretty good shape then, and then yeah. he flew the plane, and he won the Congressional Medal of Honor. Uh, wow. And, yeah, for taking charge yeah. of the plane. So. But he not only took charge of the plane, after the pilot was, after he knocked out the pilot, but they got the bombs dropped, and they completed the mission. <laughs> In the shadow. <laughs> everybody, everybody was happy. How do, what ended up with the pilot? He died. I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I don't know whatever happened. I suppose he died. Yeah. I. Uh, well, what happened when you got on the ground there? You had those arti those. Uh, well, maybe first I should explain this navigator. See, when you had a crew, you became so close, probably even closer than your brothers and sisters. Yeah. You were really close. Well, this navigator 
When a new crew came over from the United States, they'd take and put two or three of that crew on with an experienced crew. And he was one of those that, he was a navigator that had never won a mission. And here he was shot down on his first mission. But anyhow, uh, when we were uh, captured, before we were captured, there was a little cave there. And Jim Hunter, his name was Jim Hunter, he crawled in that little cave. Uh, he had lost his 45 anyhow. Yeah. And I was the only one with a 45, and I was behind this big rock. And here these guys were coming up after us, and every once in a while they'd let a, off a shot. I don't know whether they were shooting directly at, at us, but it made us feel pretty uncomfortable. Anyhow, I'd shoot a couple times. I shot a couple times, and then, and then about that time I got heard the brush rustle behind me, and I looked around, and here was a Yugoslav standing there with one of those German burp guns. Uh oh, yeah. I remember one of those burp guns. Yeah. Like burp, and yeah. about six shells. Yeah. Anyhow, the hole looked about that big in the end of the barrel, and so then I just let that 45 drop in the snow, and thus we were captured. Was it snow on the ground? Winter time? Oh God! It was snow. Was snow was three, four feet yeah. deep. That's why they caught us as quick as they did. Yeah. Because what kind of clothing did you have? Well, we had all our flying clothes on. Kind of including the heated electric heated suit and all work. Yeah, you had all of yeah. And all the whole crew had electric yeah. flying suit and, yeah. and you could adjust the temperature yeah. on them. We even had wires in our goggles to keep the yeah. goggles clear. Yeah, no, I I wasn't didn't have that sophisticated. No, say what happened then after you were picked up and captured? What where in the world did you go? Or? Well, we headed down the mountain. Or the, I don't know if you call a mountain. It wasn't all rocks. So. It was trees all the way, but uh, we ended up in a little village, and we were in a room probably 20 by 30 feet, maybe not quite that big, and it was lined with radios. And what they were doing were monitoring the, the American bases in Italy. And when oh. B-24s would take off, then they'd apparently wire Something. Germany and yeah. tell them there was another group on the way. And so we spent the night there. There was two guys there. They didn't pay any attention to us, and we didn't pay too much to them. And uh, They were monitoring all these radios then. Yeah. yeah. And so then we were in a private home, and, uh, and that was kind of different too. There was no central heating. No. And uh, well, I, the one incident I really remember is uh, there was three girls three daughters. Well, there was more daughters than that, but anyhow, these three daughters were going to bed, and we were laying on the floor, and with all our clothes and everything on, and they were down there, and they had a tick, you know, one of those mattresses filled yeah. with straw, and they'd pull this big nightgown over there, over everything, and then they'd start fling, <laughs> flinging off these undergarments <laughs> underneath. <coughs> and you know, and uh, we didn't know which way to look. The grandmother and the daughter was sleeping in that end of the bedroom, and and the another and the mother and the father was sleeping at the other end. So, so it was kind of you never just quite see anything like that in America. Were you? Uh, how many of the of you were there then? POWs. There was only two of us. Just two, you two. Uh, yeah. I and the navigator. Were those? Because uh, see, we were delayed getting out, so yeah. we were further behind. Well, now were these? Uh, yeah, you were. Were you were guarded too? That were you? Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we had four guards. Four guards. Yeah. But uh, what we didn't know, and why you know, like up there on the mountain, uh, I'd carry down a, mu a musette bag with flea powder and soap and GI shoes. I don't know if you guys flew with GI shoes on or not, but we will f wear the sheepskin booties and and uh, but anyhow they thought I was English at first and they were mean as the devil with me. Well, yeah. then as soon as they saw the American patch, they changed their attitude. They did. They they, they, they didn't. Uh, no. They were the enemy, but yet they were they treated us, yeah. us with respect. Yeah. And so that was great, but uh, I don't know where was I. How long were you at that uh, room then, or that house with those, where those? Well, we were there, we were probably there 10 days. Oh, you were? And they fed you and everything? And yeah. Fed the guards too then, or? Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. The guards, uh, 
usually usually the guards that's one thing we noticed about Yugoslavia the partisans would be back in the hills and uh, and uh, Ustasi and the Germans we were captured by Ustasha. What what uh, what type of organization was that? Well, that's that's a regular Yugoslav. There you can hear once in a while on the TV now. I see. Uh, but they 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 all kind of love to fight. I thought maybe that's not not being right talking that way. But uh, there was the Doberbrands, the Chetniks, and uh, the Ustasi and the Partisan. And Tito was a partisan, and he was the one that ended up. But it was Mihalovich that was getting all the Americans. Yeah. Any any Americans he captured, he uh, traded them for a hundred dollars. Oh. So maybe that was one reason they wanted. Maybe that was one reason they were so friendly. <laughs> we're worth a hundred bucks to them. But a hundred dollars over there at that time would be quite a bit. Would be a lot of money. Uh, they're very, they're very, very poor. A lot of the people wore British uniforms. That's women and yeah. boys, and uh, the, the English had dropped a lot of yeah. supplies in, in Yugoslavia. Where'd you go then, from that house? So well, we there? headed for the English lines, and then we ran, ran into a regular German Wehrmacht patrol, and they took us away from the Yugoslavs. Uh, from the Ustasi, and uh, from then on we headed up for Germany, and we didn't stop until we got to Germany. How far did you march then, or walk? Oh, God. Would you have food or anything, or slept in the... Uh, where'd you sleep at night? Pretty cold, I suppose. We slept as... Sometimes we even slept outside in the snow. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes we slept in barns. Sometimes yeah. you never knew where you were going to sleep. Yeah. And uh, I remember... We stopped at one little village, and uh, we were there probably three, four days, a week, a week maybe. And uh, the partisans, they were prisoners, but they went and cooked and baked the German bread for the German army. When they'd come home, they'd bring all this wood and sticks, and they'd start a heck of a fire. And uh, about midnight or 1 o'clock, they'd run out of wood, and then the rest of the night we'd freeze. But uh, that's where we learned how to pick our lights off and snap them, and, and uh, we we discovered we were lousy. Yeah, and uh, most guys had head lights, and by the time they got to Nuremberg, it's one thing we did have was razor blades. They cut all their hair off, but I never did yet. Uh, never had a problem with head lights. I don't know why, but. It, Maybe. Well, uh, some you know, some people are. I knew a guy that was allergic to those lice, and and he just swelled up and all raw and so on. You know, you know, different people are. React. Lice affect different people different ways. React different. Well, how where'd you go then you, on this long trip of yours? Where you marched? Well, then, then when we headed, we uh, came back over the same country we'd been through, and we headed up for Germany, and we traveled by sled and uh, pulled by even oxen and uh, by horses and and uh, then we eventually traveled by train which we didn't care for because they're always getting the heck shot out of them by Americans. Yes, yeah, really, straight from Americans. Yeah, straight well, from train. We were really more scared of the Americans uh, as far as dying yeah. than we were of the Germans. Germans. But uh, one thing we had two showers in four months. The first shower we had was before we entered Germany. They didn't want you dragging in lice and everything. So they took all your clothes and ran them through a heat process and uh, gave us a shower, and then we put the clothes back on. And then we had another shower later on in, in camp, which was really disturbing to us because we didn't realize what our condition was. And uh, we saw all these ribs going. and. It made us. We, were, we went over there singing, but when we came back, that was what, pretty uh, what quiet. What camp were you at then? We're uh, we're in Nuremberg. 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 That's a pretty big camp, was it? Well, I think it was. You know, I I don't know how many numbers were there, but it was a big camp. Se several thousand. Oh yeah. Where's yeah. Nuremberg from? Uh, Berlin. I I would say it's to the south south uh, west yeah. of Berlin. Hundred miles, couple hundred miles. Yeah, at least a couple yeah. hundred. Of course. Did you stay there the rest of the time, or? 
stay there most of the time until the Mar Americans and Russians start pushing in. Where where'd you get interrogated? Did you get interrogated? Got interrogated before Frankfurt, and uh, we got that was Frankfurt on the main. Yeah. And we were in. Well, uh, Frankfurt on the main now. The Frankfurt on the oh yeah okay yeah. Frankfurt. Main yeah, on the Rhine River there or main. I think that's uh, See, 50 there, years ago. Yeah, there were two. There were two Frankfurts I think. Frankfurt yeah. on the older. And Frankfurt on the main. On the main. Uh, yeah. I think this is on the main. Yeah. Did you did you go into regular interrogation center? Well, in, interrogation was was stressful. Yeah. It uh, you were in individual yeah. cells. It was about probably well, it was probably six feet wide because it had two planks for a bed, and you could just barely lay on that, and probably ten twelve feet deep. And then when you were fed, uh, there was a little door there that opened up. You had to find some bread and water on there. And was that on the floor? They slided. No, the, no it was about. It was what about. Shelf? Yeah, it was about a head high. Oh yeah. yeah. And that was. A, they didn't want you to know what time it was. That you know your watch had been long gone. And uh, the only thing is, that they couldn't control was uh, aircraft going over, and we could just about tell which was the uh, British. Missions in which was uh, American because Americans were so much longer, yeah. and so we we still kind of kept track of time a little bit. Yeah, but they didn't really want you to know, and uh, interrogation was tough because you're sitting there and you don't know whether five minutes passed or an hour, or half a day or what, and just to keep saying. And I know other guys would talk the same way, that I would go to, I'd get in my. 31 Chevy back home and start it up and go into town, stop at the first house and visit and have a cup of coffee, you know, and this is running through my mind. And then I go to the next house and visit. And because yeah. and when you're like that, you, you know, when you're, you got nothing to think about, your brain just yeah. about, you just about go crazy. Solitary confinement is very tough. Uh, what kind of food do you have there in solitary confinement? Well, I think that was mostly bread and water, and I think it was most, you know, we weren't too hungry there, I don't think. It wasn't until we got to Nuremberg that we really yeah. got low on rations because, you know, I really don't blame the Germans too much for that because what are you going to feed? You're going to feed your prisoners or are you going to feed your people first? Yeah. And I don't think the people had that much extra yeah. eat. So I think, uh, yeah. it does. but we, what we were worried about, we, we figured the United States and the Allies were going to win the war, sure. but were they going to win it soon enough? Yeah, because uh, we're, they were they were already starving in uh, in prison camp, and uh, yeah. if it had went on another six months, I'm afraid there'd have been a long, big loss of lives in prison camp. In that uh, prison camp you were at, were you in a barracks in a room, or uh, was it just big bays, or in the in the last camp we were in. Uh, we, it was big bays. It was really. Did they have shelves or beds? We had bunks. Bunks, yeah. yeah. Two or three high, or uh, three high. Yeah. And the first one we were in uh, in Nuremberg, there were no bunks. No. And so we all got in a corner of the room, just like a bunch of little pigs, and and laid on the floor and and Tried kept to together up. to get yeah. to get keep warm. Yeah. And I, I know our, you know, we were skinny. Besides, when you laid on the floor, your hip bones were sore, and sores developed yeah. on your hip bones, and all wherever your bones yeah. contacted the floor, it yeah. was I don't there was yeah. sore. Yeah. Well, we, uh, I don't know if you're. Of course, no, our mattresses weren't much of a. They had mattresses there, but they weren't really mattresses in yeah. what we call mattresses here. Yeah. I mean, it's just a piece of cloth mm. or some straw or something. No, it wasn't, it wasn't what about clothing? Did you have pretty? What kind of clothing did you have when you got to the camp there? Well, they took our, you know, an a, this is an eighty-two jacket. And That's the uh, jacket that the pilots or the officers usually had on the, on uh, the yeah. I'm sure in the summertime you could wear something like this. We never did. Oh, sure. Yeah, we wore we ours year round. Winter yeah. time. And, from Italy. From and, England. Uh, we wore all the clothing we could get on, and and probably that's probably. Well, you know, we were lucky to have that clothing when we got to prison camp. That's but right. then they took it away from us and gave us GI 
overcoats and, and clothes. At, uh, at your camp. Yeah. What camp was that again? Well, Nuremberg and Mooseburg. Yeah. And, uh, Were those camps very far apart, Mooseburg and Nuremberg? Well, they were far enough apart if you had to travel by rail and yeah. you had the Americans pounding away at the rails. Did you, ha did you ever run into any concentration camps or see any around there? After, when we were first liberated, of course, there was no provisions to feed us. And oh. we scrounged, and that was in the Munich area. And uh, we got into Dachau. And, of course, we'd never ever heard of uh, these concentration camps or anything like that. And uh, we actually saw the, a couple of wagons with the people piled on them, and, and we turned around and got out of there. Yeah. Now, how long? <clears throat> when, how did the war end? What, what happened when the war came to an end, as far as you were concerned, in your well, camp? Well, uh, the Patton liberated us. Patton's tanks liberated us. I see. And the night before they were going to battle, they went out and visited. You know, we were all we were all organized. We had a guy, American, that was the head of the camp, and they had similar organization. But we were all organized into groups and everything. I mean, after, after the Germans left? No, oh, it was it even before, before. Oh, in, I see. in okay. camp we were even organized. Yeah. Because if you didn't get food or something, you had to have somebody to complain to, sure. to yeah. the Germans. And so uh, they went out and met with Americans and the Germans before the night before, and there was enough SS there. The SS would, they never gave up or they never, they'd love to, sure. they'd love to take care of you. And uh, so, no, they decided they were going to battle it out. So about 10.30 in the morning, just like going to work, they just started lobbing shells in and, well, they never, they never even lobbed any shells into the camp, but, uh, but the Americans, anyhow, put it to them and they come. The tanks rolled right through the fence, and and of course they couldn't stop to talk, or they couldn't stop for a day or so and visit no. with us. They had a war to fight, yeah. so they kept on going. And uh, but a lot of GIs and jeeps would stop in, and they'd have rations in the bottom of their pickup and K rations and things like that. And somebody'd say, "You haven't got a spare ration, have you?" And the guy, the GI, would say, "Yeah, I think there's one here." And just about that time. And that thing would be covered with POWs <laughs> fighting to get those carriages. What about the Germans? What happened to the German guards? Did they disappear or did you take them? They prisoner? took uh, the German guards. Germans were all, they were all, uh, you know, they were wounded, legs missing, arms missing, hands missing. The guards. Yeah, the yeah. guards and kids even. Yeah. And uh, they came to us that morning and in the center of the camp there was a place for, if you had, POWs that went haywire. Yeah. If they couldn't stand the stress, they put them in there. And of course, we released those guys right away, and we took all our guards and put them in there. They wanted to go in there. Yeah. They didn't want it. They knew the war was over. Yeah, they didn't sure. want to fight. No. They didn't want to die. So, no. so uh, how long did you stay there after the war? Then in this camp? Well, we were there probably, probably a week. How many? War. Did you have any other crew members with you by then? Did you have the whole crew there? Had the bombardier there. And had the navigator there. The navigator apparently, well, he <coughs> he uh, he was a real sick man. He was he emotionally was, or both. physically. Both. Both. Yeah, both. He was he was uh, he wouldn't get out of bed or anything. He just laid there and he was just going getting worse every day and so on. But. Uh, <clears throat> it was a tough on him. It was real tough on him. Yeah, I, I know at our camp we had a couple guys there. Well, yeah, I don't even like to talk about them. Because they, they were ready and uh, never got out of bed. They couldn't really. I mean, they were mm -hmm. just mentally. Well, we, you know, you had guys with you that had wounds and things like that. And, yeah. and by that time, the Germans were using paper for bandages. And, yeah. and uh, those guys would, all of a sudden, they'd disappear. They'd, Say they're gone to the hospital. What happened to them? I really don't know. They, they might not have finished the war. I don't know. No, no, a lot of, a lot of missing. You know. Yeah. yeah. 
The only, uh, when I was in Germany, at least the only medicine I know the Germans had was aspirin, I guess. I Is mean, that, that, that's the only thing they had. I don't know if they had. I didn't have any, but I guess no matter how sick you were, they give you an aspirin. Then. Well, the one good thing that happened to us was the Red Cross parcel. Oh, yeah. I don't, yeah. I don't think we'd have made it no. if it went for Red no. Cross. Because you they could take that Red Cross parcel and there'd be seven packs of cigarettes in there. Yeah. And you could really, you could trade that for rutabagas and... Yeah and beets and potatoes or whatever they had you could trade. And, yeah. and what kind of farming country was it around their camps there that you s saw that? What farming did you observe? Well, I think around, uh, I think around Mooseburg it was, uh, it was kind of, it was profitable farming, yeah. I think, in that area. But uh, we really didn't get around that much no. to see too much. What about, you get any letters from home? Never got a letter. No. But w after I got home here. Yeah, then you got. I got all the letters. My wife. My wife wrote a letter every day, <clears throat> and we never got those until I got back. No, no, that same thing happened to me. Yeah, and uh, that was one thing about the Red Cross. Had you fill out these forms. Yeah. And for some reason, that really helped you feel that at least they know where the ha where yeah. I am, and if I don't make it well, they know what happened to yeah. you. And uh, they know you're <coughs> prisoners. Yeah, that give you relief yeah. for some reason. But uh, yeah. did your uh, did your folks or relatives get any information from a shortwave radio, for example, that they broadcast from Germany? No, no, not that I know. No, of. not that you know. No, my wife, my wife was working in Fargo and, and for a doctor. And what we about uh, when the when you were liberated? Now we'll say, and then you were all together. Where where'd you go then, or what happened then? We were liberated. Uh, we finally got, you know, they we were out scrounging around, and there was prisoners killing pigs and chickens, and and not cooking it good enough, and eating it, and a lot of sick guys for a while. Yeah. But then, uh, then by the time we got used to eating again, here comes the army with the special food for us and everything, which which we didn't really appreciate too much. <laughs> no, it's. Uh, it was, well, they were doing everything they could. Where'd you go then, or did you stay there quite a no, while no, after the war? Well, we, we well, you know, we t Patton talked to us. Yeah. He was going to take C-54s and fly us all back to the United yeah. States, and boy, he was, he was our hero. That's sure. the kind of talk we like to hear. Yeah. But then it ended up, we traveled by truck to, in fact, we were in Reims, France the day Eisenhower was there and, and signed, signed something, I guess it was the treaty or yeah. something. And uh, we were to Paris, and I know in Paris I had a crew member that got tight, and I had to take him back to the tent area, and there was hundreds and hundreds of tents in that area. At uh, back, uh, Lucky Strike. Was that Lucky Strike then? I think this was Paris. Paris had a tent and, area there. Uh, there yeah. was a tent area there too, and uh, Anyhow, he and I finally crawled in a tent and went to sleep for the yeah. night. The next morning I woke up and here Pat was arguing with the guy whose ever tent this was. And pretty soon there's two hairy legs come out. And I was underneath the bunk there and I could see this colonel's blouse <laughs> hanging on the, on the side of the tent. And I rolled out of bed and I grabbed Pat and I said, hey, let's get out of here. And, and we're going down the street there and this guy's hollering at us he's gone he, uh, thank goodness he didn't wasn't dressed because he would probably probably pursued us but uh <clears throat> pat was all we we had a good crew we had a wonderful crew yeah we had a really a good bunch and they are good there's uh three of them gone yeah. two of them by heart, heart attacks and one by uh, aneurysm and but uh we we still get together now then, then you, you ended up at Lucky Strike, didn't you? That big yeah, camp. Yeah, I ended up at Lucky Strike. Yeah, that was a giant oh, camp. Oh, that was a biggest camp in the world. I think there were seventy-five thousand well, people there. Well, there was a lot of tents. Oh, yeah, uh, stretched as far as the eye could see. Yeah. yeah. Then would you get on a boat coming back? Well, then they then they offered us to take us to North Africa or or uh, where's that Southern France area that, where the casinos are? Uh, Monaco. Or, yeah, yeah, Monaco. And uh, no, we didn't leave that camp. We were not moving until we could get on a boat. 
And we worried all the way home that some German submarine commander hadn't got the message that the war was over. Yeah. And um, when we got back to the States, that was great. Where do you get? Boston? New York? Or? Yeah, Boston. Boston. I come into Boston. And, and that's where I first talked to my wife. Then they had a little, uh, then you went to, did you go to Camp Kilmer or a place like that? Camp McCoy, I think. Camp McCoy. That's in, uh, in Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Anyhow, we went to Minneapolis, and uh, you go to Fort Snelling, then maybe. Uh, well, well, we were, I was in, we were living in the Nicollet Hotel. Okay. I had lots of money because we had that prisoner of war. Where'd they get? where you get? Oh, you got the money from Camp McCoy. Yeah. Then. Well, I can't remember whether they made a, but anyhow, we had the money, and I, I didn't. We were having such a good time. I hated to go home even, but anyhow, if I, my wife said you got to go home. Your dad's waiting for you. And so we got on the train and went home, and we got to Fargo. Sure enough, he was waiting. He'd been going from, for about a week, he'd been going from one, one depot to the other, meeting every train from Minneapolis, you know, and yeah. geez, I felt kind of bad about it. But then we went home, and we had the big meals, and they had the, everything was great. Showers, yeah. all you wanted to shower, <laughs> bathe, I think that was. What, then you, uh, you got out of the service center. Did you go back for a while, or? No, I was just about, I got out right away. Yeah. Well, did you get back into business or farming or? Yeah, I got into farming. Yeah. Now, you were a state senator, too, there for, what, what years well, were you state senator? From that area? Is that for the county or? Uh, from Pemina County yeah. in that district. I was, I was in the state senator from 74 to, for 18 years now. Now, that is, yeah, most of that time was Democratic governors, weren't they, or? Well, quite a, too much of the time. We're <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, yeah, we had a lot of Democrats. In fact, we the Senate was even controlled for the first time by Democrats Yeah. when, when I was there. <clears throat> yeah, I should, uh, you know, just as a commentary, I should say that, uh, well, I was going to take my dad, he was a senator too, but that's beside the point. But, you know, I've looked at all these prisoners of war that come back from Germany or Italy or North Africa, and I noticed that none of them, you know, when they come back, uh, they didn't turn to drugs and alcohol, mm -hmm. or they didn't burn the flag, or they didn't march up and down mm -hmm. the streets and complain. Most of them, uh, they were solid citizens before they left, and when they come back, they got right into the into into being solid citizens again, being that as a farmer or a businessman or. A, Working in a post office or truck driver or whatever it was, so I think those those prisoners of war uh, were good citizens. Well, yeah. and you know most of them too had a they'd had it gone through a pretty tough time before the war. I mean, they, you know the depression. Yeah. So they were uh, they were tough enough for this war and for the prison life. And well. so I think I think you can be proud of uh, yourself for, and for the other guys too that. Uh, you know, the guys that went through there. I've always been quite happy that I was in the Air Corps, and I think sure. I, but I don't know if I'd want to do it over again. Oh, no. And, uh, 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 no, it's, uh, I've had a good life, and I, I think my dad was more or less responsible for me, because I, I did want to stay in the Air Force, and I did yeah. want to fly. I forget what the next generation of bombers were, but yeah. I don't know. I think there was one in between the 52 and the 24. Well, there weren't uh, the airplanes after the war, when you come back to the States, the airplanes were not as well maintained as they were in the war, incidentally, because, you know, the better guys got out. Yeah. And you had the guys that perhaps not as experienced or new guys in there maintaining them. So the accident rate was very high after the war in the States here. So, uh, and it was a different different service, of course. There was yeah. All that. They changed the name of the Army Air Corps to the U.S. Air Force. And yeah. And then they finally got to be the Air Force. And yeah. <coughs> well, what do you want to tell us now, Kent, about, you just mentioned a couple of things about what you, you thought you were satisfied with what you had done and satisfied with your life and so on. Well, I, uh, I, uh, my first, uh, I've been married twice. My first wife died uh, December of 92. She had had cancer for eight years. Oh, my. 
and uh, she was a great gal and uh, and the gal I married her husband had cancer and uh, he died and yeah. so we got together and we're we're living a pretty good yeah. life we go to we go to Arizona for two three months three months yeah. every year and uh, I'm more or less retired myself. Have you, have you still got an interest in your farm? Well I farm a little bit yeah. just because it's uh, convenient, I suppose. Yeah, you know, I I, I kind of like to get out there yeah, once in sure. a while, but I, I'm getting less and less <laughs> <laughs> inclined to get out there now. You don't have any big ambitions then to get rich or something in some uh, big no, enterprise. No, I think I've got enough to take care of me. <laughs> I do, you know, I do feel kind of sorry for these young people. I think they're carrying quite a load with our Social Security. I think uh, I think we should get around to balance on the budget, but. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> well, it's such you know. We were we come maybe from a generation the last that the yeah. one spouse worked and the other spouse raised the family yeah, and right. but now yeah. it's uh, both both just about have to work to make a living uh, to make a good living. Yeah. I think maybe they live better. Yeah. But uh, I think they're a little more. They're not satisfied until they, unless they do live quite well. And well, there's there's two kind of things, you know. Uh, there's what they call a scale of living. That's how you spend your money. Well, yeah. They really know how to do that. But yeah. standard living is is how you save money for the future, yeah. and that's that's where they they fall down. But then uh, who are we to criticize? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> but uh, you know, it's a question now. We had uh, World War One, then we had World War Two. Uh, it's a question now whether Maybe there'll be another big war eventually again. I mean, uh, maybe, well, we're in a, maybe we're in a in a tranquil period here between the great wars. I don't know. Uh, I don't no think I, I don't think there'll ever be another war like like we had. It'll be oh, a no, no, push button like war and and uh, here today and gone tomorrow. Uh, it might be. <laughs> yeah. Well, do you have anything else to say, Kent? If not, do you want to thank you for coming here down here? visiting with us. And well, I want to thank story. you for asking me. Yeah, well. I did write a little book. Yeah, say, show that. Uh, and that, that's a book that Kent uh, wrote about his experience. Well, I've, I've noticed they've been showing pictures of it every once in a while oh, yeah. on, on the screen. Yeah. But uh, the reason I did write it, my kids were always after me to write sure. something. Well, and I, I knew I wasn't going to get it done because I've never been that ambitious. No. And so I put it on tape. Yeah. One day I was coming from Bismarck, and I yeah. put it on tape. And then my nephew took it, and he put it on computer. Sure. And then I added to the first part and added sure. to the back, well, back truly, part yeah. and uh, these printed books, it. Yeah, these personal books like this are terrific. I well, mean, I, think, I think everybody should do it. I think yeah, especially, I've, I've written one. I mean, especially uh, yeah. veterans. Especially right. somebody, you know. Especially uh, when you have a, a unique experience that... You know, no future generation you know, just will about, ever have. Just about all of us have had a unique experience. That's right. If you've served in yeah. the Air Force. And sometimes when we talk about it, you know, about a name, I think what uh, one of the organizations I belong to, you know, they said, well, you know, no one wants to be a hero and no one wants to be a this and that. But we're all lucky. You know, we belong to it. Yeah. We're all lucky. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so thanks a lot again. Well, thank you for... Yeah. Well, even thinking about me. Oh yeah, we got to think about. <laughs> we'll see you, Albert. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'll take my paraphernalia here.
let me prove that it adores the loveliness of yours. 